Chapter One of Christmas Eve at Swamp's End. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Christmas Eve at Swamp's End by Norman Duncan. Chapter One The Wistful Heart. It was long afternoon in the far, big, white northwest. Day was on the wing. Christmas Eve splendidly impended, thank God for unspoiled childish faith and joys of children everywhere. Christmas Eve was fairly within view and welcoming hail, at last in the thickening eastern shadows. Long day at its close day in a perturbation of blessed unselfishness day with its tasks of love not half accomplished and day near done bedtime coming round the world on the jump nine o'clock leaping from longitude to longitude night impatient and determined chasing all the children of the world in drowsy expectation to sleep making a clean sweep of em every one with her soft wide broom of dusk nine o'clock shoo off you go to-morrow's on the way soon oh soon to-morrow's here when you fall asleep said em already have you not another word from either of you not a whisper ye grinning rascals Cuddle down, little people of Christ's heart and leading. Snuggle close, closer yet, my children, that your arms may grow used to this loving. Another kiss from mother? Blessed ones, a billion more for nights and mornings, for all day long of all the years, waiting here on mother's lips. And now to sleep. Christmas is tomorrow hush to-morrow yes to-morrow go to sleep go to sleep and upon the flying heels of night but still far over seas from the blustering white northwest where patty batch was waiting at swamp's end in the woods the new day with jolly countenance broad rosy and delighted was somewhere approaching in a gale of childish laughter, blithely calling in its westward sweep to all Christian children to awaken to their peculiar and eternal joy. It was Christmas weather in the big woods, a Christmas temperature like frozen steel, thirty below in the clearing of Swamp's End, and a rollicking wind careering over the pines and the swirling dust of snow in the metallic air a cold crisp crackling world a christmas land too a vast expanse of christmas color from the canadian line to the big river great grave green pines white earth and a blood-red sunset the low log cabins of the lumber camps were smothered in snow they were fringed with pendant ice at the eaves and banked high with drifts and all window frosted the trails were thigh deep and drifting the pines their great fall imminent now flaunted long black arms in the gale they creaked they swished they droned they crackled with frost it was coming on dusk the deeper reaches of the forest were already dark horses and teamsters sawyers road monkeys axemen swampers punk hunters and all floundered from the bush white with dry snow icicled and frosted like a christmas cake to the roaring bunk-house fires to a voracious employment at the cook's long tables and to an expanding festival jollity town sure swamp's end for christmas 
the lights and companionship of the bedraggled shanty lumber town in the clearing of swamp's end swamp's end for gingerbread jenkins swamp's end for billy the beast swamp's end and the roaring hilarity thereof for man and boy straw boss and cookie of the lumberjacks presently the dim trails from the cant hook cutting from the bottle river camps from snook's landing and the yellow tail works poured the boys into town a lusty hilarious crew like loosed schoolboys on a lark giving over now to the only distractions it seemed and john fairmeadow maintained it which the great world provided in the forests patty batch might have been aware of this the log shack was on the edge of town had not the window panes been coated thick with christmas frost she might have heard rough laughter passing by the bottle river trail ran right past the door had not the big christmas wind snored in the stove and fearsomely rattled the door and shaken the cabin and swept howling on but she never in the world would have attended not in that emergency she would not for anything have peeped out of the windows in perfectly proper curiosity to watch the bottle river jacks flounder into town not she patty batch was busy patty batch was so desperately employed that her swift little fingers demanded all the attention that the most alert the brightest the very most bewitching gray eyes in the whole wide world could bestow upon anything whatsoever christmas eve you see day done something of soft fawn skin engaged her it seemed with white patches matched and arranged with marvellous exactitude something made for warmth in the wind something of small fashion but long and indubitably capacious something with a hood a little cloak possibly i don't know but i am sure that it could envelop that it could boil or roast, that it could fairly smother a baby. It was lined with golden-brown crackling silk, which Patty Batch's mother had left in her trunk, upon her last departure, poor woman, from the sordid world of Swamp's End, to regions which were now become in Patty Batch's loving vision places of light and it was upon this treasured cloth that patty batch's flashing needle was working like mad in the lamplight a christmas sacrifice it was labor of love and the gift of treasure patty batch was lovely everybody knew it and there's no denying it grief had not left her wan and apathetic she had been a little man she had been so much of a little man that she was now much more of a little woman than ever she had been before in respect to her bewitching endearments there's no mincing matters at all it would shame a man to him and haw and qualify she was adorable beauty of youth and heart of tenderness a quaint little womanly child of seventeen gowned now in a black dress long-skirted to be sure of her mother's old-fashioned wearing gray eyes wide dark-lashed sun-sparkling and shadowy and wilful dark hair a sweetly tilted little nose a boyish masterful way coquettish twinkles dimples in most perilous places rosy cheeks a tender little figure an aristocratic toss to her head why indeed the catalogue of her charms has no end to it courage to boot too as though youth and loveliness were not sufficient endowment and uncompromising honesty with herself and all the world she took in washing from the camps 
there was nothing else to do with grey billy batch lost in rattle water and now decently stowed away by the reverend john fairmeadow it was lonely in grey billy batch's cabin now of course it was sometimes almost intolerably so and ghostly too with echoes of long past footsteps and memories of soft motherly words patty batch however a practical little person knew in her own mind you must be informed exactly how to still the haunting echoes and transform the memories into blessed companions of her busy gentle solitude but she had not as yet managed the solution patty batch wanted a baby companionship of course would be a mere by-product of a baby's presence in the cabin the real wealth and advantage would be a glowing satisfaction in the baby at any rate patty batch wanted one she always had and she simply couldn't help it babies however were not numerous at swamp's end in point of fact there was only one a perfectly adorable infant it must be understood a suitable child and worthy in every respect of being heartily desired by any woman which unhappily belonged to the bartender who lived with pale peter of the red elephant saloon no use asking for that baby not outright it could be borrowed however patty batch had borrowed it she had borrowed it frequently of late and had mysteriously measured it with a calculating eye and had estimated and scowled in doubt and scratched her head and pursed her sweet red lips and had secretly spanned the baby from chin to toe and across the back with an industriously inquiring thumb and little finger but a borrowed baby it seems is of no use whatsoever the satisfaction is said to be temporary nothing more and to leave a sense of vacant arms and a stinging aggravation of envy so what patty batch wanted was a baby to keep a baby she could call her own and cherish against meddling a baby that should be so rosy and fat and curly so neat and white so scrubbed and highly polished from crown to toe-nails that every mother in the land beholding would promptly expire on the spot of amazement incredulity and sheer jealousy there were babies at elegant corners a frowsy listless mud-hole of the woods near by they were all possessed by one mother too the last comer had appeared in the fall of the year and patty batch when the great news came down to swamp's end had instantly taken the trail for elegant corners got another eh huh? says she flatly to the wretched mrs limp uh-huh mrs limp sighed and rolled her eyes as though god save us the ultimate misfortune had fallen upon her number eight she groaned don't you like it patty demanded uh, hopefully mrs limp was so deeply submerged in tears that she failed to commit herself you don't like it eh huh? patty pursued hope immediately abounding mrs limp sniffed well said patty her little heart all in a flutter she was afflicted too with an adorable lisp in excitement i suppose i ought to be sorry mrs limp seemed dolefully to agree patty batch came then straight to the point i've been savin up said she i've been hard at it for more'n seven months mrs limp lifted her blue eyelids yup said patty briskly and i got thirty-four twenty-three right here in my skirt where's that baby 
the baby was fetched and deposited in her arms boy or girl patty inquired with business-like precision boy mrs limp sighed thank god patty batch was vastly disappointed she had fancied a girl it was a shock indeed to her ardour it was so much of a shocking disappointment that patty batch might easily have wept a boy a boy oh shoot but still she reflected considering the scarcity a boy this boy in fact cleaned up patty batch was all the time running the mottled infant over with sharply appraising eyes yes the child had possibilities unquestionably so which soap and water might astonishingly improve and in fine this little boy might mrs limp said patty looking that lady straight in the eye i'll give you twenty-five dollars for this here baby by george i will the astonished mother jumped out of her chair and her lassitude at the same instant not another cent patty craftily declared here take your baby mrs limp did not quite take the baby that would be but a pale indication of the speed directness and outraged determination with which she acted she snatched the baby away with the precision of a brisk woodpecker after an escaping worm and she hugged it until it howled for mercy and she hushed it and she crooned endearment and she kissed the baby with such fervour and persistency that she saved its puckered face a washing and then she turned in a rage of indignation in a storm of scorn at a whirlwind of execration upon poor little patty batch but patty batch was gone discreet little patty batch didn't need to be told her little feet were already pattering over the trail to swamp's end and she was crying as she ran but patty batch's wish for a baby went back to the very beginnings of things ask gingerbread jenkins gingerbread jenkins knows it was gingerbread jenkins who had found her long ago patty was little more than a baby herself then on the bottle river trail and to gingerbread jenkins astonishment the child was lugging a gun into the woods where you goin says gingerbread jenkins gunnin gunnin a uh? what for jeff gunnin but what you gunnin for none of your bithneth says saucy little patty batch it is my business gingerbread jenkins declared and if you don't tell me what you're gunnin for i'll have you home in a jiffy well says patty i'm a gunnin what for storks says patty goin to kill em gingerbread inquired no says patty what you gunnin for i'm goin to wing a couple says patty and tame em that was patty batch End of chapter 1 The Wistful Heart